Good evening. Welcome to the last Accuracy in Academia Authors Night of the year. Until next year. We are we try to do these in order to bring you the speakers and uh, topics and information that you can't get on campus and frequently on uh, congressional committees even. But at any rate, this, I should mention these are brought to you by a grant from the Frank A. Fusco and Nellie Galetti Fusco Foundation, for which we are most grateful. And our speaker tonight is someone you can occasionally get on campus if you're lucky. But I was privileged to meet this gentleman in Indianapolis at the Philadelphia Society meeting where he gave a talk that just rocked the house Friday night. And William Barclay Allen, professor emeritus, University of Michigan, author, six books, all worth reading. And a incredibly modest gentleman. We kind of hit it off, I'd like to think, because we're both smokers. At any rate. Uh, but I didn't realize that how incredibly modest he was, because it wasn't until I got back to DC and did a blog on his talk that I realized this was the Dr. Allen that headed the Civil Rights Commission under President Bush. You know, uh, an incredibly accomplished man. And the topic he's going to address is what exactly our national identity is. And he's a man well worth listening to who we are proud and privileged to have with us. Dr. William Barclay Allen. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you this evening. You've had the chance to have a conversation, so I hope you're primed to speak up as we go into this topic and we raise some questions that ought today to be very much on our minds, given the confusion there often is in our society about who we are. So we want to explore that particular question. I will say I appreciate the introduction, Mel, but I'm always religious in reminding people that I was appointed head of the Commission on Civil Rights by Ronald Reagan. I served into the Bush administration and therefore under George Bush. But I'm an appointee of Ronald Reagan, and that is a very special claim for me. Uh, let me also say, before I begin, that I think this is something that you are doing that is especially worthwhile. Accuracy in academia is an effort to reclaim honesty in academic discourse. And as we can have seen from the most recent turmoils on our campuses, and the latest fad of seeking to enforce safe spaces, there's nothing more needed in this day and age than accuracy and honesty in academia. And I'll give you a warning, this is not a safe space. So if you're sensitive and might be offended, this is a good time to absent yourself because I don't practice safe spaces, I, I practice candid inquiry. And that is what I would invite all to do to the degree that they wish to become strengthened in their opinions and understandings. But to the topic, I had told Mal that what I would talk about tonight would be seeking the unum in the pluribus. We all know, of course, our familiar national motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one. We sometimes forget, as we celebrate the many, the importance of the one and the necessity of seeking the one in the many. This is therefore a topic which we can rehearse beginning from the founding of the United States up to the present time. There are two things George Washington said that are of momentous significance in this regard and that go a long way into shaping everything that we want to talk about. The first of those things, he said, was that this country, this new country, and this was in 1783, 85, this new country was to be an asylum for the poor and oppressed of every nation and religion. It is on the stress of statements like that, as well as others, that I entitled my book on George Washington, America's First Progressive. 
for those kinds of ideals are not new in the United States. They are there from the beginning. They've been enunciated by that one individual who is most profoundly the founder of the United States. But he said something else in 1783 in his famous circular address to the governors of the 13 states about the time that he was resigning his military commission. He said, we have a work to do in this country still. We have a national character to establish. A national character to establish. And what I submit is that to understand George Washington, you must take those two statements and put them together. Yes, America was to be an asylum for the poor and the oppressed of every nation and religion. And that therefore commits us to what we like today to celebrate as diversity. But he also said, we have a national character to establish, which means he expected to set a standard and a tone for that, those poor and oppressed of every nation and religion. They would come to the United States and they would not simply relocate from where they were, continuing to be who they were, they would become new. They would become what Trevor Kerr called the new man, this new American. So our inquiry is, what is the national character that was to be established that George Washington had in mind? It's important to ask, was it ever established? Did we ever get there? Was there a point in our history when we could say what an American was? And is it still true today, if it ever was the case? Or was it lost along the way? Is it possible that we lost sight of who we became, or at least what we were intended to become? That's the fundamental question. I am not at all reluctant to say that we live today with a great deal of confusion about this question of who we are and what it means to be an American. Earlier this afternoon, I was addressing the Citizens Equal Rights Alliance, which is concerned foremost with federal Indian policy and reminding them of how Tragically, we've handled the question of Indians in the United States, particularly in the modern era. And when I speak of handling it tragically, I'm not talking about Andrew Jackson and the Indian removals. That was a travesty. That was a terrible thing. But that's not what I have in mind. I'm not talking about the often exaggerated and false allegations about the European extermination of the Indians, the genocide of the Indians. That's not what I mean when I refer to tragedy in federal Indian policy. I mean the embrace of a policy that began perhaps most decisively in the administration of Richard Nixon when we decided Indians were no longer going to be considered Americans. And I say no longer because there did arise a moment in the 1920s when Congress enacted a statute seeking to clarify the status of American Indians and extended United States citizenship wholesale to American Indians. So as to say, there's no longer a question whether Indians belong or don't belong. All Indians are extended citizenship. They don't have to make any special efforts to obtain it. They don't have to file papers for it. They are simply American citizens. But what we began to do with federal Indian policy, the policy of tribal recognition, and we're up to about 600 tribes now throughout the United States, was to begin to cordon off Indians as a distinct group, having separately conceived standing before the law in the United States. We see reservations as islands on which the Constitution does not fully apply. Take, for example, the Indian Civil Rights Act. That act, you would think from its title, means to guarantee civil rights for Indians. What it actually does is to limit the application of standard guarantees of civil rights on Indian reservations. Civil rights for Indians are a diminished version of what we know that are the rights of American citizens. Similarly, the Indian Child Welfare Act 
You would think this is an attempt to bolster the welfare of children, except what it does is to institute a regime in which children are treated as cultural artifacts rather than as human beings. And rather than having their interest in their welfare bolstered, they are in fact deliberately excluded from what we know as the best interest determination when looking at the welfare of children. And this happens across the board in the federal Indian territory. The notion that the tribes have sovereignty, that they deal directly with the federal government, which is a custodial power and authority over Indian tribes, subtly erodes the meaning of our own constitution. And the best way for me to convey this to you is to explain that we live under a government, under a constitution that was specifically designed as a limited government. And what is meant by limited government is the government has only certain powers, enumerated powers. And those enumerated powers establish barriers beyond which government should not go. But our government, in its dealings with Indian tribes, asserts plenary power not limited power, absolute power, that any government of the United States, which is after all a representative government and that represents us, can assert absolute power over anything, runs completely contrary to all our expectations of limited government. So we see in that very concrete picture part of the difficulty we have in an age in which we are constantly struggling with government assistance upon establishing authorities and powers, particularly through regulatory apparatus that go beyond anything that can be called consistent with the idea of limited government, and more particularly than the idea of limited government, the idea of self-government. So we return to the question of national character. What was an American supposed to be? Well, the first thing, the most important thing every American was to be, was to become someone who vindicated the claim that we are by nature endowed with the capacity for self-government. And we mean by self-government, governing of ourselves. We don't mean just majority rule or democracy or anything like that. We really do mean the proposition that human beings can govern themselves. And therefore, we designed a limited government in order to make good on that observation, in order to cash in the reasoning from natural law and the account of natural rights, which produced in the first place the idea that self-government was our heritage. Self-government was our gift from God. Self-government is not just a right. It is a necessity for human flourishing. The national character that George Washington sought to establish, that he expected us to step into, was precisely that character in which we could achieve human flourishing. And to do that in ways that distance us from the practices of the old world, the world that existed in Washington's terms in the age of ignorance and superstition. So, we today seem less aware of that particular requirement. We seem less cognizant of the obligation that falls on our shoulders as individuals to govern ourselves, to take responsibility for ourselves, to assert that responsibility in preference to the establishment of governmental regulations. There is somewhere at the very center of our national existence, and I mean this in moral and political terms, a reciprocal relationship between citizens and their government, which we simply no longer fully know how to articulate. We have lost our way. And it's something of a crisis. This is what we talked about in Indianapolis, the address to which Mal referred in his introduction. And in opening that address, I shared some remarks 
that I made on the occasion of receiving the Salvatore Prize in November of 2014. And I'm going to quote those here just so that you have a feeling for what it is that I'm talking about. And they read as follows. We have a problem. When we say we, we mean the citizens of the United States, and still more particularly, those who undertake systematically to explain what constitutes us citizens or a people in the United States. The intuitive sense is scarcely more than a vague geographic sensibility, while a more substantive construction now eludes us almost completely. The problem resides in confusion as to whether what constitutes us a people is a particular moral or political conformation or rather some less deliberate yet nonetheless evident cultural expression. The problem is that we have become clumsy about describing ourselves as a people in terms of what used to be called national character. For to some, if not many, the idea of character is a loaded term, implying the development of some specific moral or ethical expression that operates to divide us separating those attaining the warranted degree of expression from other persons in the United States or elsewhere. Nevertheless, we find it awkward and difficult to speak of our collective existence in any meaningful sense, independently of some such distinguishing function. Our problem, then, is that we desire to be a people, but hesitate to be a chosen people. A nation of immigrants, we like to say, as if to imply that the immigrants always remain immigrants and never become Americans. Common sense reprehends the very idea, while common practice relies upon it in our most important collective judgments. So what did I mean by that? What's contained in those brief remarks? Well, one thing certainly above anything else, and that is that when we are explaining our diversities as our only distinction, we are misrepresenting America. And we are certainly aware that many people have that bad habit of celebrating our diversity as a distinction of the United States. Our current president is one who practices that ritual. But that is a false representation of this country, that we have diversity that is all very good, that people come from many regions, cultures, and backgrounds. That's all very good. But that is not what makes us good. What makes us good is that we can receive human beings from wherever they may come and make them Americans. That is what makes us good. That we can find the essentially human and give it moral and political force and effectiveness such that people don't have to fall back on the crutches of ancient tradition in order to attain dignity. Their dignity doesn't come from their inherited cultural experience. It comes from their exercise of the principal human virtues. If America is anything, if the American character is anything, it is that form of life which elicits the exercise of the principal human virtues. And unless we are asserting that that is what we aim for, that that is what distinguishes us, we are not, in fact, accurately describing what it means to be an American. This is a matter that I think is so important that I regard it as something of a crisis because we are not, in being ambiguous, in being hesitant to embrace the idea of national character, we are not actually living up to the character of Republicans. And I mean by Republicans, of course, small r. I'm referring to that political form through which we establish our lives. I mean that to be Republican is to assert the legitimacy of the form of government under which we live, and to establish that legitimacy in the terms that were made current in the Declaration of Independence and on so many occasions in the history of this nation since that time. There is an element of this life, this national life, which is imposing 
and which imposes upon us a burden constantly to reenact the founding moment within our own souls. We must be as if it were signers of the Declaration of Independence, committing ourselves to the observation, the declaration, that all men are created equal, and that they have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in order to pursue and attain which, we go on to institute governments of such form as to satisfy those very persons who exercise these rights themselves. That is not a vacuous statement. That is a meaningful statement. It is a statement you make to the mirror. It is a statement you make to yourself. It is an affirmation of oneself as well as an affirmation of one's fellows. Of course, that long first sentence of the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence concludes by developing our mutual collective responsibility to act not only to create but to sustain good government. We bear the responsibility as citizens Government doesn't bear the responsibility. We can't transfer the responsibility to government without undermining our status as citizens and our character as Americans. So it is important, as it seems to me, for us to reflect on what it is that leads us in this day and age to be lukewarm at best in our attachment to being Americans. We can count the issues that divide us and inquire how far they are reconcilable to the judgments of majority rule. Begin with the question of what constitutes authority in our federal structure for the deciding judgment on the questions of life and value. We pursue the debate on religious liberty, not with the resolution to rest all our hopes on the free development of persons and communities <coughs> expressing their judgments in their states. Rather, we wrestle for a national rule, ultimately to be imposed by the Supreme Court. <coughs> Deference to the people has been replaced by commanding the people. The reason of the people has been replaced by the artificial reason of the judiciary or the arbitrary exertion of executive prerogative. Whether the issue is abortion or same-sex marriage, the people are commanded to stifle their views in subjection to not the rule of law duly established by representative institutions, but the rule of lawyers. And I want to underscore that. There is a command to subjection. And remember what subjection means. We distinguish between a citizen, properly so called, from a subject, which is the case in other regimes, say monarchy, for example, precisely because in those other non-republican regimes, the individual doesn't have a stake. The individual may be a beneficiary, government may be benign, but the individual does not have a stake. The individual is not rep rep represented or depicted as a primary agent. The individual is a subject the passive recipient of the force of government, rather than the authorizer of government action. And that is an extraordinary contrast. It is one that we require to keep alive in order to sustain a due American national character. Are we keeping it alive? That's the question I'm posing to you this evening. Are we keeping it alive? Is there enough plain, old-fashioned pride in being American? Is there enough pride in being responsible, in upholding the standards that were relevant and prevalent in the hour of the American Revolution and the founding of the United States? I spent the last two days over at Mount Vernon leading a group of teachers from all over the country in a conversation about the first and second administration of President Washington. And we were there concerned primarily with the question of what did it take for him to navigate the many controversies that colored 
the first eight years under the Constitution of the United States. Uh, how good a leader was he? How effective was he in communicating to the public at large the character of the government that he was putting in place for the first time without precedent, having nothing to fall back upon but solid good sense and judgment? So as we talked about this, and this was a particularly good seminar, these teachers were some of the <coughs> brightest from around the country and particularly effective in getting to the root of the matter. But that root of the matter, one of the things that we elicited in the course of our conversation was a sense that George Washington was able to subordinate himself and his ego. And this is not to say he was at all a modest man. That is not the claim. He was nevertheless able to subordinate himself to the superior claims of the moral experience in which he was involved. And that's what is important, being able to find leadership that does not assert its superiority, but rather asserts the superiority of the claims of the people of the United States that will defer to the character of the citizens, that will enlist the citizens in defending the justice of this political regime. When Washington closed his farewell address, one of the strident themes among many that he struck was the importance that this society, unlike governments elsewhere in the world, must be a consistent practicer of justice in its dealings with others. Why did it have to be a consistent practicer of justice in dealing with others? Because it did not have an absolute prince who could engage in all the intricacies of diplomacy and who could lie and unlie without having to worry about it. Because whatever this government did, it did in the name of and on behalf of the people of these United States. They had to be ultimately responsible. And you couldn't expect them to turn on a dime. You couldn't expect them to follow the intricacies of statecraft where deception was the rule. You instead have to develop a consistent mode of conduct, and that mode of conduct has to be justice in all relations in order to keep them on board so that they can fulfill their role, which is the decisive role. Our conversation made clear that the whole point of trying to secure Republican government was to secure the predominance of public opinion in the society. Not public opinion as a fleeting expression of sentiments that you might collect in a Gallup poll from day to day. That's not public opinion. Public opinion is a settled standard of judgment, a fixed criterion of justice, an understanding of what is required in order to preserve legitimacy. And that means, therefore, the sustained support for the institutions themselves, the willingness to make decisions through these institutional processes and not to allow the various trumps of interest to decide the questions of the day. Well, that only leads us to the question, what is the role of the citizen? And I submit it is to superintend the exercise of legislative authority and the administration of the laws. Public opinion, not as the ephemeral reflection of daily polling, but as a settled expression of majority sentiment, is the vehicle through which this superintendence takes place. James Madison established this standard at the outset of life under the Constitution, and this is what he said. Public opinion sets bounds to every government and is the real sovereign in every free one. As there are cases where the public opinion must be obeyed by the government, so there are cases where not being fixed, it may be influenced by the government. This distinction, if kept in view, would prevent or decide many debates on the respect due from the government to the sentiments of the people. Madison's argument is carefully balanced, establishing the authority of public opinion, while nonetheless making room for displays of statesmanship that can shape public opinion. In that sense, his argument is altogether consistent with the argument that Abraham Lincoln gave when he said, our government rests in public opinion. Whoever can change public opinion can change the government practically just so much. Public opinion on any subject always has a central idea from which all its minor thoughts radiate. 
That central idea in our political public opinion at the beginning was, and until recently has continued to be, the equality of men. And although it was always submitted patiently to whatever of inequality there seemed to be as a matter of actual necessity, its constant working has been a steady progress toward the practical equality of all men. That was 1856, Abraham Lincoln at the Republican banquet in Chicago. We find Lincoln here responding to a political crisis with deliberate efforts to steer the ship of state back toward political equilibrium. So what's the difference between then and now? Well, of course, on the surface, there are huge differences. Uh, slavery doesn't exist. There's not an immediate threat of secession. We don't have, by any stretch of the imagination, the right to call the political crises that we face equivalent to the political crisis that Abraham Lincoln faced. He was, as I said, trying to hold together a ship that was breaking apart what Jim Pearson calls a shattered consensus. In our time, the political polarization is all the more dismaying precisely because it derives not from deviation from a single pole, but rather from the multiplication of polar differences to all appearances ad infinitum. I return to the safe spaces debate if you want to see one of the, idea, one of the evidences of fragmentation in our society, the difficulty of getting people to find common grounds of expression, <coughs> common understanding, around which people can gather and which all can affirm even while expressing themselves differently on political questions or public issues. Uh, we, uh, I don't know how much time you spent on university campuses. I spent my whole life in, in the academy. And I can tell you, I have witnessed the deterioration over the course of time. It is no longer to be assumed that freedom of speech prevails on a university campus. Instead, there are codes of speech. I would say codes of conduct, except the conduct that is most severely restricted is speech on our campuses today. And it is not because the speech is of the outrageously obscene variety which we might be perhaps sympathetic to trying to control. After all, a society in which obscenity, vulgarity, and profanity is rampant uh, is not one that would be pleasant to live in. But no, it is rather these speech controls over expressions of opinion about social and even personal relationships which some declare to be offensive to them not because they're offensive in themselves, not because they violate standards of decency long established through millennia of practice, but out of an excess of political correctness. Now, that is not merely a problem of the academy. And this is the point of my remark, and this can perhaps sum up the whole conversation this evening. What I'm suggesting to you is not that there are outliers a few extremists who have colored campuses, especially in elite institutions, whom the rest of us can look at as perhaps uh, uh, in, in their own way testaments to our virtue because they're so unlike us. No, that is not the case. What they are illustrating is what is becoming pervasive. We are imposing it. We're imposing it through the hand of authority. It descends from campuses to police departments. It invades bureaucracies of every stripe. It invades corporations. We invest huge <coughs> sums of money in administrative budgets to seek to impose these kinds of sensitivities throughout the society. In short, we're trying to so calibrate the society that we stifle the potential for individuals to express themselves freely. This is radiating out from the campuses, I say, throughout the society at large. This accounts for the polarization. And people are being riven by it. It has often been remarked that today, people don't participate 
in common sources of information, that they in fact tend to uh, isolate themselves into their niche markets. They listen to particular outlets for news, or they read particular variants of literature. They don't expose themselves to diverse views and understandings. It is, of course, ironic that as we celebrate diversity, the one diversity that we cannot tolerate is a diversity of opinion. That is utterly unacceptable in the current day and age. But my point is, it is not merely with respect to the academy. I'll illustrate it with something that was in the news this morning. Very telling. I'm sure no one noticed it besides myself, because I'm sensitive to these things. Perhaps I should say, I was offended by it, and I should complain to NPR that they offended me and they shouldn't do it. They, they invaded my safe space. But what happened was the NPR reporter was uh, interviewing an official from Belgium who was talking about the neighborhood from which some of the terrorists come. And he said that the efforts undertaken by the authorities in Belgium were to clean up that neighborhood. Now, you would think the NPR reporter would say, well, how are you going to clean it up? Uh, what does cleaning it up mean? How far are you going to carry this? Uh, how wide a problem do you think it is? What do you think the numbers are? There are any possible series of follow-ups to that question. But the NPR reporter had only one follow-up, which wasn't immediately understood, so he was insistent on it and kept coming back to it. He says, did you hear what you said? Clean it up? What, what, what does that suggest? Uh, what does that imply about your attitude towards the people in that community? Is this, clean it up? Is, is, is that acceptable, that mode of expression? In other words, he was displaying the sensibility, the sensitivity that I'm talking about. He was treating it as code language for some species of racism and wanted to therefore tag this Belgian official with be having anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim sentiment, <coughs> rather than seeing the obvious thing that this official was describing, a crisis they were in the middle of and they needed to do something about in order to produce security in their country. Well, what that NPR reporter did was totally subconscious because he has so internalized the current state of the discourse that it comes to him automatically to speak in those terms. He was unaware of the problem. And that's what I mean when I say it's pervasive. It is extended beyond the academy. It colors our relations and our interactions in many fora throughout the society. So we need to be able to ask ourselves tough questions about what it will require of us as citizens in order to put an end to this kind of thing. And I would suggest that reviving our national character means reviving the Republican modalities of our national life. Not only opinions must be revived, but practices must be revivified. <coughs> Systematic modes of communication to elected and appointed officials must be developed. Something other than the routine generation of letters from constituents by partisan apparatchiks. Of course, the best way to accomplish that is to engender a pervasive and constant discourse imbued with the principles here called for. In 1838, Abraham Lincoln called for every mother to whisper the love of liberty to every lisping babe that travels on her lap. Well, we need the grown-up version of that appeal, casting a light through our public darkness toward a love of republicanism for every aspiring citizen.